Stalin removes himself from the scene of death. He takes a working holiday in the resort town of Sochi. There he contemplates his next move. Yagoda, he suspects, is losing his zeal. Yagoda must go. Returning to Moscow, Stalin is greeted by a welcoming committee. He shakes hands with everybody except Yagoda. It is the end of Yagoda's career. And his life. Yagoda is relieved and descends the cellar steps. His replacement is Stalin's adoring aide-de-camp, Nikolai Yeshov. Yeshov stands five feet tall, has the mind of a hyena, and will go down in history as the bloody dwarf. Unlike Yagoda, who could shed tears, Yeshov is pitiless. The widow of Bukharin, one of the party leaders, recalls Yagoda. From the wife of Prokofiev, who was Yagoda's deputy, I learned that Stalin had ordered Yagoda to torture Kamenev and Zinoviev. Yagoda told this to my husband and uh, burst into tears. Well, Yagoda was different from all the rest of the people's commissars. He was a party member since 1907, and of course, it wasn't because he wanted to make himself a career that he joined the party, but because he was a revolutionary, an idealist. But gradually, under the influence of fear, his character was corrupted. The new year, 1937, is ushered in with merriment and optimism. The dreaded Yagoda has himself been liquidated. His NKVD successor, Yeshov, appears a harmless, almost comic little man. Stalin begins his year with a top secret edict, one that will make 1937 a high watermark of terror. Not only does Stalin legalize torture of state enemies, he recommends it. The NKVD gets the news. Now, to work. Leonid Reichmann, former NKVD officer. When our revolutionary brothers were abroad, we knew they were subjected to torture and humiliation. But we took a liberal attitude towards the enemies of Soviet power. We interrogated them with kid gloves. When it was proposed that we resort to methods of physical persuasion against these enemies, we were all dumbfounded. Together with others, I came out and said, this is something I fail to understand. Perhaps from a political point of view, this is right. But from an operative point of view, this is wrong. Because if I hit an arrested person in the face, then I'll never know whether or not he is telling me the truth. Stalin is indifferent to the truth. He knows that most of his victims are innocent, but he also understands a larger truth, that in order to inspire terror so great as to keep him the undisputed ruler of 200 million Soviets, it is necessary to execute not only the guilty, but the innocent as well. Casting Yezhov as Lord High Executioner is inspired. Stalin sees into his stunted soul. He knows that for the cruel joke played on him by nature, the bloody dwarf will take terrible revenge on the world of other humans. Yezhov turns first on the NKVD. He empties the Lubyanka of the old guard. The Jedzinski and Yagoda men, veterans of the October Revolution, whose loyalties belong to the past, who have no stomach for the new order of official sadism, down the cellar steps they go. Yezhov replaces them with young party workers. Zealots brought up in the certain knowledge that Stalin is infallible. Yezhov looses them on the land. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Mikhailov of the KGB. 
The mass reprisals were directed against the kulaks, against the merchants, against the clergy, against all kinds of elements that at that time were considered socially undesirable. And when the social categories had been done away with, they continued on with the nationalities. They began to arrest Germans, Poles, then Latvians, and so on. And whole ethnic populations were put through the grinder. Stalin's megalomania is equaled only by his paranoia. No one is above suspicion. Even the holiest of holies, the Red Army Officer Corps, is fed to Yezhov's meat grinder. Because their esprit and collective strength threaten Stalin, they must go. Even the Supreme Military Council will go. Stalin calls it together. A survivor of that meeting is Ivan Polishchuk. Yezhov sat at the table, and since he was a short man, he could hardly be seen. He kept squirming in his seat. His main officials kept a watch over what was going on, and he would signal to them. And then the military council commanders began to disappear. A moment before, they were sitting next to us. We talked to them, but after a little while, they disappeared. Yezhov acted triumphant, as if he had exposed and rid the Red Army of treason. And by the end of the meeting, there was hardly half of the council left. The issue is not treason. Stalin is simply taking precautions. His grand strategy is impartial. Liquidate anyone, at any level, on any pretext, who is capable of resistance. Stalin's press turns up the heat. It creates an all-pervasive environment of hate, suspicion, and vindictiveness. It is the task of every Soviet patriot to put an end to political complacency and to turn each factory into an impregnable fortress that not a single enemy can penetrate. Artist Volya Lebedinsky. If a man was at home, they would take him away. If he wasn't, they were in Kiridim and so brazen they would simply arrest his neighbor instead. They had to bring in 12 persons so they might even pick up someone on the way. But the question, why was the person arrested and what was he accused of, practically never came up. Journalist Theodore Gladkov is the son of a Soviet intelligence officer. In those years, address books disappeared from circulation in Moscow. They were on sale in stationery shops, but no one bought them. No one used pocket address books. Why? For the simple reason that when a person was arrested, the first thing that was taken from him was his address book. And all the people whose names were entered in that book were also arrested. The NKVD pounces anywhere and everywhere at the dinner table. In shops, on the dance floor, Hospital patients are abducted. They're seized in the field, at a university lecture, a museum, a soccer stadium, aboard a train, on holiday. <laughs> 